What's up, kinfolk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Thank you for watching the live show on Sunday. That is September 22nd. We got to talk about a lot, man. Uh, if you're here, please consider hitting the subscribe button. We are very close to 110,000 subscribers. The past week, 800,000 people have watched this show. It's really cool. It's me talking with you. We're having these conversations. If you're in the live chat, say hi. If not, you know, we'll catch you in the comments. You know, you'll get to see the clips on the channel. Remember, subscribe to the number one college football show. So I want to talk about Oklahoma. I want to talk about QB1 and what that means. Also, perhaps they'll get to this before you see this, or maybe if you're here live, you're going to get to know this. If you go look up Michael Hawkins Jr. and look at his roster photo at Oklahoma, he gets to wear a hat. I'm going to assume that's because we did not expect that Michael Hawkins Jr. would need to have a professional photo headed into week five when Oklahoma plays Auburn, but that's looking like what it's going to be because I can't tell you why I would not think that Michael Hopkins Jr. is QB1, and in Oklahoma, we take our hats off when we wear these photos, when we do these photos, and we take our hats off when we go inside, we take our hats off when we go in church, we take our hats off when we sing the national anthem, we take our hats off when we pray. I'm just saying, take the ball cap off his head, let's get that man a proper headshot because, well, that's the guy at Oklahoma. I also want to talk a little bit about Travis Hunter and, and really what he has been able to do at Colorado, which is unprecedented, and give you a couple of comps and really why he should walk away as the Heisman Trophy winner in, I think, the most important year of college football ever. I want to talk about Hugh Freeze being really down bad, and I want to talk about Oklahoma and a quarterback controversy as well as a field controversy because all of a sudden— Chris Fowler had the nerve to say something about high grass, and now y'all all in the comments about this if you're Tennessee fans. Oklahoma fans like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, this, this, this track has been pretty damn fast for the last decade. Gonna say it's doing just fine. But I want to start with the biggest game on the schedule this year, and that is Alabama at Georgia, right? right? Maybe not this year, but maybe definitely this week, right? Not a whole lot else going on on that front when we're talking about ranked matchups. There are a few. Don't get me wrong. There are a few. And there's some very intriguing games, right? But the one that we're all paying attention to is absolutely going to be Alabama hosting Georgia. This is number two at number five. Or number four. Excuse me. I got Tennessee at four. They got Alabama at four. So number two versus number four according to the AP Associated Pro uh, Press Rankings. Now, I think I can make this observation without it coming off like I think it might for some because this is not a political show, and we don't do that. We don't really talk about politics at all on this show. However, I do think it is important to point out that 45 might be making a trip to Alabama to watch Georgia-Alabama play, and 45 has – that is president, 45th president of the United States – 45 has made more trips – to a uh, college football game in the past, well, five years than any other college or uh, any other sitting president, and I think that's or any other past president or sitting for that matter, and I think that's significant. I also think that speaks to the magnitude of what this game is likely to do. And frankly, I expect ESPN to blow it all the way out for this game because we could see the 2024 national champion arise from this game, and we could also see the SEC champion, arise from this game. And this game is going to directly impact what could be the biggest game for Georgia all year and, frankly, will be the biggest game that Texas has played since 2009 when the Bulldogs venture over to Austin to take on the Texas Longhorns. I think Texas would love for Georgia to win this game for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is Georgia would be coming to them with a consecutive regular season win streak that is – really, really unprecedented in this modern era of college football, okay? They have won every regular season that game they have played going back to, like, 2020, the last time they lost a regular season game. But when you're talking about an Achilles heel for Kirby Smart and you're talking about an Achilles heel for Georgia, what you've been talking about is Nick Saban. You haven't really been talking about Alabama. You've been talking about Nick Saban. And the reason I can say that is Nick Saban – is 
five and one against Kirby Smart all time. Okay, they would get there, and and he can give them the what for and the how now. And until we saw Jimbo Fisher was able to do it, no assistant had come against Nick Saban and got a W like that. Man, it just didn't happen. And then all of a sudden, everybody getting him in. Kirby got him in. Steve Sarkeesian got it in. Lane Kiffin couldn't quite get there. And Nick got up out of dodge before Ole Miss could get that W. But you get my point here. To be an assistant coach for Nick Saban is to become a head coach somewhere else. But it also means that you're probably going to take a L to Alabama if he's on your menu. So I think this game is going to be as much about Kirby versus Kalen and Styles making fights. We have an offensive football coach versus a defensive football coach as head coaches, right? Kalen DeBoer's claim to fame is Michael Penix Jr. And really being able to stretch the field, put the ball into his playmaker's hands, and let them go do something. Usually that's a quarterback, right? When he had Jake Hayner at Fresno State, well, good. Michael Penix Jr. comes back from injury after injury. But when he's had Kalen DeBoer at Indiana, had Kalen DeBoer at Washington, he could absolutely sling it. We knew that Jalen Milrow had all the goods to be – the best player in college football if you could put it all together. There's still some things in his game I would like to see cleaned up, but you're already seeing Kalen DeBoer and Nick Sheridan have put together quite a great game plan for him. We are going to be explosive. Either Jalen is going to take off and hit you for 25 or he's going to hit you over the head for 50 through the air. It's the middle of the field throw that we would like to see Jalen Milrow get better at. As a matter of fact, my guy Quincy Avery, we do a show right here every Wednesday unpacking some of the best and worst of college football quarterbacks. And one of the things he had told me is dudes that tend to be top heavy, meaning big shoulders, sturdy, what you would think of as, you know, some version of Jalen Hurts playing quarterback, usually have a hard time throwing a ball slightly across the middle because it's a layered throw. And for whatever reason, the throwing mechanics aren't always there. I'm going to trust him on that because he knows more about quarterbacking than I do. He works with guys like Deshaun Watson, Jalen Hurts, Josh Dobbs. You name it, he works with them. He's always meeting with them on Sundays after their games. He's flying everywhere you go. But I was really getting intrigued by what he might be able to see from Jalen Milrow and what he would like to see against Georgia. We'll probably talk a bit about that. It's also high time for Carson Beck to show us all why everybody keeps putting him in the Heisman Trophy conversation. Like, I got to get talked into this. I really do. And every now and again, when I am doing a list of some kind, I have this conversation with producers and I have this conversation with editors and I might leave out a guy like Carson Beck and they'll be like, RJ, he's the quarterback on one of the best teams in college football. Yeah, but does that make him a Heisman Trophy candidate? But I didn't think this about Stetson Bennett either, right? I don't think that just because you're the quarterback on the best team makes you the best player. When you got Joe Burrow at LSU, that's easy, right? When you got Lamar Jackson at at Louisville, that's easy. We can keep doing that, right? But even Michigan last year did not have the best. The best player on the team was not J.J. McCarthy, you know? It's can you show me that you can go get a W on the road in a hostile environment? Again, it's a defense that's pretty good, especially when Carson Beck gets to say, hey, I go against the best defense in college football and practice every single year. Okay, show me that. Because right now, all Carson Beck has done is get beat in the SEC championship game. That's it. He hadn't won a damn thing. And everybody, all this talk about why he wanted to be the guy that would, could take Georgia to a three-peat is gone. Right? That's gone. They squandered that opportunity with the loss to Alabama. And Alabama took that opportunity and made it to the college football playoff. Now, he's in the spot where Carson Beck was looked upon as a much more talented player than Stetson Bennett. And already, Stetson Bennett has shown himself to be a better quarterback, if for no other reason than check the resume, my guy. Stetson Bennett walked on twice at Georgia, and Carson Beck, basically made in a lab to go play quarterback at Georgia, hadn't been able to win games like this one. He is 0-1 as starting quarterback against Alabama, and Jalen Milrow is 1-0. I want to see... What it is that makes Carson Beck one of the best players in college football, according to some. But handing the ball to Trevor Etienne ain't going to do that for me, right? Th throwing the ball casually to Oscar Delp or Dylan Bell, okay, maybe. We'll see. But when you're in a dogfight against the Kentucky Wildcats on the road, and you're lucky to escape with your life because you couldn't score any points, that does not scream to me that Carson Beck is important to winning, okay? 
If he's important to winning, they can go into Bryant Denny and they can come out with a W and they can look to be undefeated because right now, Georgia is undefeated and was put at number two by the AP because of how crappily they looked against Kentucky, regardless of what Texas did, right? And now we got even more data to show that Texas is a very good football team and worthy as number one spot. But Georgia was in that spot that I was putting Nick Saban, or that Nick Saban put him in, and that I put him in, which is until somebody beats them, it's Georgia because they've earned that over the last three years. They have been the most dominant team in football south of the Mason-Dixon line. Michigan came on strong the last year in particular. But for the most part, we're talking about it's Georgia's world and people living in it. Well, this is the time to make that true. This is when Georgia is supposed to show up and give what we think is the third or fourth best team in the SEC, the what for and the how now on the road. Kirby Smart has won 16 consecutive road games, okay? This is what time when you need to do it a 17th time. If for no other reason, then yeah, you want people to start taking you seriously. I, do they care about the rankings? No, not till the college football playoff rankings come out, but you do want to be front of mind when people think about you as a no-doubter because the loser of the SEC championship game looks like the five seed. And the five seed this year is going to host a playoff game probably against the highest-ranked group of five champion, which right now projects to be someone like Boise State or UNLV, which might as well be a buy for that team, right? That said, if Georgia were to lose this game and then make the SEC championship game, would we still put them in the five spot? Or would we put them in perhaps the nine or the 10 or the 11 where they got to go on the road? I don't know. I guess it depends on what you think that they did against Alabama and what they do against Texas a little bit later on in the month of October. But I'm really fascinated to find out what Georgia team shows up because right now Georgia has had a week off and the last time we saw them play, they looked bored. They looked like they could care less. They were down on the defensive line. I know that. They lost Tate Ratledge uh, during that game. I know that. You know that. But do you have a do you have an answer, not just for Jalen Milrow, but for Jam Miller? Do you have an answer at corner for the Wonderkin that is Ryan Williams, who reclassified? He should be a senior in high school right now, reclassified to go play at Alabama and is one of the three best wide receivers in the sport already. What's your answer out there? I'm, I'm curious. I want to know. And if you could put a lid on him, maybe you got a shot. Maybe you think you got something for Kobe Prentice. Maybe you think you got something for Jeremy Bernard. Maybe you think you got something for Jalen Milrow. But I need to see it. Because right now, Alabama looks like a team that can play from behind down two touchdowns and go beat you. Because they'll find a way to score and score quickly. Remember, South Florida took them into the deep water, right? That game was 14-13 for entirely too long, right? And then what happened? The last 10 minutes of the game, Alabama Black Dynamite exploded. For 28 points in 10 minutes. I ain't seen that kind of urgency out of the Georgia football team all year. They have been starting slow as hell. They have not got out of the blocks. They have played their best football in the third quarter. You might not get a chance to do that against an Alabama team that is looking to score and score often. You got an Alabama defense that I think matches up really well with this Georgia offense. Can Georgia run the football? We'll find out. Right? Can Alabama stop the run? Didn't look like it did do that against South Florida. So we'll, 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 we'll see, right? I think that this is going to be a really intriguing game, but mostly because we're all intrigued by it. And it is getting us back to what we think of as the status quo. Whatever Alabama, Georgia do, and then we make our decisions based on which of those teams we think is the best. But right now we can see a real changing of the guard in this year without Nick Saban and where Kalen DeBoer gets to firmly establish himself as the guy – who might be next to run the SEC while we got Kirby Smart doing what Kirby Smart has done, okay?